Good afternoon and welcome everyone to the Green Mountain Care Board meeting. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board. The first item on the agenda is the Executive Director's Report, Susan Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't have a, a, a significant amount to report out, only just to remind folks that they should just keep an eye on our um, website and our um, press release for upcoming meetings. We have a couple of meetings next week and the week after that are TBD, um, but we will certainly warn those um, meetings if there anything if there's anything added to those agendas and we'll adjust the press release. And I and I believe there already was an addition this week. We added a primary care advisory group on Wednesday. October 21st. So just keep an eye on that. And that's all I have to report out. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of September 29th and September 30th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of September 29th and September 30th without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those, those opposed signify by saying nay. Thank you, everyone. So the first item on uh, this afternoon's agenda will be uh, a discussion of the quality standards. And for that, I'm going to turn it over to Michelle Degree to tee that up. Michelle. Thank you, Chair Mullen. So, uh, we are here today to discuss the final 2019 quality results. Uh, for the one care payer specific contracts. Um, so as GMCB staff, I'll be wearing two hats today. I thought about actually like bringing hats, but I didn't. Uh, so the first one will be as GMCB staff, just overview of the program requirements and what we're looking at here today. And the second uh, sort of role that I'll play today is in reviewing the actual Medicare results for 2020. 2019, not 2020, for 2019. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is um, introduce everyone that I have with me here today. So from Diva, I know that I have Pat Jones and Amy Coonrat on the line. Uh, from Blue Cross Blue Shield, I have Andrew Garland and uh, Tyler Gothier has joined from One Care Vermont. So hello to everyone. Um, what I will do is share my screen and I will advance the slides throughout the presentation. So once I'm done, um, I'll pass it over to Medicaid. Um, just give me a, a signal and I'll, I'll advance the slides for you. So uh, first things first, just a quick agenda for today that I just kind of went through, but I'll be providing some background uh, just on the results that we're looking at here today. Then we'll review each of the payer results. So we'll start with Medicare, then we'll go to Medicaid and commercial, and then there's an opportunity for the ACO to provide comment. This is in the same format as we did this presentation last November. Um, then we'll go to board questions and public comment. Starting off with some background. Um, I just want to kind of remind folks that today is about assessing performance on the ACO quality measures that are set forth in the payer contracts between the ACO and the, and the payers. This is not an evaluation of the all-payer model quality performance. As a reminder, um, we measure all-payer model quality report performance annually. Um, it's very likely that those results will not be released until early 2021. Um, for the 2019 year, we're just starting to get some of those data in. Obviously, we have the payer-specific data, but in terms of the claim space measures that we need to evaluate, we need a little more time for claims runout um, and for the 2019 uh, year to be finalized. Uh, so that said, Again, uh, just noting this is solely a reflection of the ACO's performance relative to payer contracts does not necessarily reflect the ACO's contribution to the state's performance within the all-payer model agreement. Um, though I will say we're currently exploring ways in which we can interpret these results in the context of APM performance. And I'll talk a little bit more about our thoughts on that um, a little later in, uh, in the presentation. Uh, so under the agreement, just a reminder that the ACO is a legal organization of healthcare providers that agree to be accountable for the quality, cost, and care of the beneficiaries assigned to it. 
the ACO skills target qualifying programs must reasonably align in their design across payers, which includes ACO payer quality measures. Um, and so you'll recall that back in 2018, we did a significant amount of work um, with the HCA and OneCare around designing the Medicare measures um, starting in the 2019 year. So we'll see those results um, here in a moment. My famous crosswalk <laughs> that I get to update every year. So uh, this year we're actually looking at the full suite of all pair model measures here in the first column. Um, and you can really see that um, we're starting to see some pretty great deal of alignment across payer programs. So you have the 2019 Medicaid Next Generation Program in the second column. The third column is the 2019 Medicare Initiative. And the fourth column is that Blue Cross Blue Shield Next Generation Program. Um, I do want to point out a couple of quick notes here. Um, for example, the initiation and engagement measure, Blue Cross does treat those as a composite. The all pair model, the Medicare initiative, and Medicaid Next Gen do treat those as separate measures. Um, so anywhere that you see sort of that blocked cell is just to indicate that the payer in that case um, sets those as a composite measure. Another note here, just um, before we get too into the weeds, um, CAPS measures, that is the Consumer Assessment of Healthcare Providers and Systems, those are the patient experience surveys. Um, each program has some type of CAPS survey um, that they uh, distribute, but they're not necessarily all the same. Um, so a couple of quick examples, the all-pair model includes the CAPS survey composite of timely care appointments and information for ACO attributed Medicare beneficiaries only. Um, but the Vermont Medicaid Next Generation Program includes multiple CAPS uh, patient-centered medical home composites. You have um, the Medicare initiative using multiple ACO CAPS composites for attributed Medicare beneficiaries. And similarly with Blue Cross, um, they include care coordination composites and tobacco cessation questions from the CAPS patient-centered medical home um, group. And just to consolidate this um, list a little bit, it was easier to make those sort of one lump, but each payer um, goes into detail about the CAPS-specific measures within their programs. Uh, so with that, just moving forward, um, while working towards payer alignment is a primary objective, not all payer programs are equivalent in terms of quality requirements. Again, um, you'll recall in 2018, we went through that work group uh, to develop and propose the measure set in the Medicare initiative um, from 2019 to 2022. And so similarities across the programs are much more noticeable in the 2019 program year than they were in 2018. Um, and differences that remain are primarily due to types of covered lives or aligned beneficiaries um, and, and make quite good sense. So for example, there's a lot of, uh, a couple of adolescent measures for Blue Cross and Medicaid populations, but not necessarily for Medicare. And that just makes sense based on their covered population. So I know <laughs> there's going to be a lot of um, questions about what can we say year over year in terms of um, advancements or changes in quality. And so while we do now have two points in time, uh, comparability is still a challenge for us. And I apologize if you can hear my dogs. Uh, so performance year one, 2018, and performance year two, 2019 data have been finalized. Um, we're working with our analytics team as well as some of our outside experts to dig into changes in quality associated with shifting populations and other factors. And so just to sort of highlight that, I wanted to show um, a quick snippet. You know, we've we've now produced two scale reports also. And so this is just showing really that population shift. So the increase in the Medicare and Medicaid populations and that um, small decrease in the commercial program from 2018 to 2019 to just show how that shifting population has the potential to impact our results and our quality um, measures. And again, that's something that we're looking into and how we can address um, to start to look at this more longitudinally. Okay, switching my hat. Medicare results for 2019. Uh, so in 2019, similar to 2018, there were four domains for Medicare. 
So we have patient and caregiver experience, which is worth 20 points. I just want to note here that's half of the total points, and they're all based on those uh, capped survey questions. So that's patient experience uh, accounting for half of the total points available. There's a care coordination and patient safety aspect, two measures there. There's a preventive health section. Uh, those, there are four measures there. A couple of notes on these. So for preventive health in the at-risk population, there were measures that were initially slated to be pay for performance and they reverted to pay for reporting um, as all activities related to the quality measure validation audit for 2019 year were canceled and that's due to the public health emergency. So that was a choice by CMS to revert those measures to pay for reporting since they could not um, perform the audits necessary to give a, a total performance score. So here's the 2019 results. Um, I know this is kind of small, but I can leave it up on the screen for a bit while we start to talk through it. Um, I did want to note, so I tried really hard to come up with a creative way to show 2018 compared to 2019, and this was the easiest. So every measure that has a star next to it was also reported in 2018. And so those will be part of the measures that we look into or that we work with OneCare on um, thinking about how we start to look at these in a longitudinal manner. So how do we think about the population shift in some of these? And how do we, um, you know, start to, to think about how to really trend this data? Um, we don't want to make assumptions based on this because we know there was a pretty significant growth and that just that, you know, the overall denominator would have a pretty significant growth. Um, so a couple of notes here for the for the Medicare results specifically. Um, CAPS measures combine responses to several questions, and as such, performance on CAPS don't represent an actual percentage, but rather the ACO's mean or average. Um, I can't say whether or not that's consistent across pairs, I would imagine, because they're all sort of on different sliding scales, but I just wanted to point that out. So in most cases, this is a percent score. In the um, case of CAPS, it's actually just the average score. Uh, the risk standardized and the all condition readmission measures, so those both of those care coordination and patient safety measures are actually inverted. So a lower score is going to be better there. Um, and you'll see in a future slide, I, I made a mistake. So Abigail, I will have to update our our, uh, our slides, but I will I, I promise I'll do that. <laughs> um, and uh, for this at-risk population section down below here, this is where you start to see the inclusion of those uh, those measures that are also part of our all-pair model set um, that were not uh, asked of the ACO in prior years. So that's where we look at follow-up after discharge from, from the ED for mental health, alcohol or other drug dependence, um, and then mental illness, and then the initiation and engagement measure looking at that for the Medicare population as well. Okay, so for 2019 quality results, um, there were 20 measures total. So again, two point maximum allows 40 possible points. The ACO's earned score was 36.75, which results in about a 92% uh, quality score for 2019. And again, just to note that those um, related, those that required a QMV audit were canceled. And so there were five measures that the ACO did receive full points just for reporting on. Um, and again, when these results, when the all pair model quality results are final, uh, we'll work to figure out how these pair specific measure results impact the state's performance. And we'll have more insight um, as to how to look at these longitudinally. That's something that uh, myself and the A team are really interested in exploring and, and trying to make sure that we can provide an accurate snapshot of performance year over year for the model. Um, I did want to give you a quick reminder of 2018. So jumping back a year, um, we went from uh, 29 measures to 20 in the 2019 year. So last year, there were 58 points available, and the ACO earned a score of 82.4%. Um, and so here's where I made a mistake. So of the 16 measures that were carried into the 2019 program, improvement was noted in 13 of those measures, not 12. So there were... Um, three measures where a decline was noticed and it was very minimal. 
Um, those were in the timely care appointments and information CAPS composite, the um, CAPS stewardship of patient resources, and risk standardized all condition re readmission. And I just really want to stress how minimal the declines were. Um, and I am working with CMMI to see if um, they did any statistical significance testing on those results to see if there really is truly a statistical um, difference in those scores. Something to just quickly talk about in terms of Medicare, um, most notably kind of the exogenous factor here of COVID-19 and the public health emergency um, really impacting some of the ability to score appropriately for the 2019 year. In addition, we talked about this, but the growing provider network and payer churn, uh, and then for, for Medicare specifically, the Vermont population demographics, we know that we have um, an aging uh, population and that um, acuity and disease burden within that aging population is higher. Um, and these are just sort of caveats that we're looking to see if we're looking into more detail to see how these might contribute to our overall results. And last but not least, uh, back into my GMCB hat, um, I really discussed some of this ad nauseum already, but GMCB staff uh, in the near term are going to dig into the impact of ACO payer quality outcomes on our state's 2019 quality performance under the model. Uh, and we'll certainly be bringing those insights before the board again, likely early in 2021. Uh, we'll be working to untangle year-over-year -year quality performance from changes in metrics due to increased scale or changes in the population. Um, and per the 2020 budget order, the ACO and the GMCB staff are working to develop a dashboard that include ACO and HSA level quality results over time. And fourth, uh, the GMCB staff are creating and publishing data visualization of cumulative APM quality results. And this adds to our existing available resources um, on our Tableau site for things like total cost of care and scale participation. Looking forward to 2020, just a couple of things that I want to note that we've heard from Medicare already. Um, Medicare at this point is slated to be pay for performance or for monitoring purposes only. This is subject to change. Um, and then currently the CMS proposed rule um, suggests the removal of the CAPS requirement for all ACOs in 2020. So full credit would be awarded, but the survey itself would not be administered. Um, so again, this is in the proposed rule. The CMS rules don't become final until usually about mid-November. So we've got at least another month until we know about that. Um, and uh, another note is just that utilization for 2020, we already know is pretty significantly down. So we're gonna have a pretty small N here to work with. And so just thinking about what 2020 looks like in the grand scheme of you know, the agreement and the five-year term, um, and then just another note that the federal evaluation of the all-payer model agreement includes an analysis of health and quality outcomes across Vermont, as well as at the ACO level over the life of the agreement. But these results won't be available until at least 2023. Uh, so we've got some time before we would, we would see those. And our hope as staff is to make sure that we can start to incorporate um, some of these analyses a little, a little earlier down the line. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Medicaid, um, Amy and Pat, if you just want to let me know when you'd like me to advance your slides. Hi, thanks, Michelle. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Okay. Hi. Um, so this is Amy Coonrod, and I'm the Director of Operations for ACO programs over at DIVA, and I am here with Pat Jones to give a brief overview of um, the Vermont Medicaid Next Generation ACO Program's quality performance for the 2019 performance year. Um, if you'd like to advance the slide, that'd be great. Great, thank you. Um, so 2019 represented the third year of the VMNG ACO Program between DIVA and OneCare, which as Michelle mentioned earlier, um, involved 13 communities and an attributed population of around 79,000 Medicaid members, which was a pretty significant increase in the attributed population from 2018, which was around 42,000. Um, 
As folks know, as a value-based payment model, the VMNG program contains a quality measure set and an associated value-based incentive fund. Part of the ACO's fixed prospective payment is set aside every month into that fund. And after the performance year, that pot of money is distributed to the network um, based on the ACO's performance on the quality measures that you see up here on the screen. Um, for the 2019 performance year, the equivalent of 2% of the total fixed prospective payment for the ACO from DIVA was set aside into this value-based incentive fund. Um, that percentage has increased every year since the program's inception. I'll just give folks a refresh that in 2017, the value-based incentive fund um, was 0.5% of the fixed prospective payment. And in 2018, it was 1.5% of that payment that was set aside into this fund. Um, after the performance year, the quality performance is calculated at the ACO level, and then a proportion of the incentive fund is distributed to one care's provider network based on its performance. Um, half of those undistributed funds um, that are left over are reinvested by one care in quality improvement initiatives at the ACO level and the other half is returned to DIVA during the financial reconciliation. Um, on this slide specifically, as a reminder, um, this table contains the ACO's quality measure set for the 2019 performance year of the VMNG program. Um, the set contains 10 payment measures and three reporting measures, one of which is that CAPS patient experience survey. Um, these measures were selected to align as closely as possible with the quality measures for the ACO's other payer programs, as well as the overarching all payer model quality measure set. But there are differences as Michelle's beautiful crosswalk shows um, to ensure that the measures are appropriate in the VMNG program for the Medicaid population. Um, next slide, please. Great. Um, so in terms of scoring, there are a total of 20 points available for the 2019 performance year, and each of the payment measures was weighted equally within the set and was scored individually. Um, where possible, one cares measure results were compared to national Medicaid benchmarks, which were available for eight of the 10 payment measures in the set. Um, if Medicaid benchmarks weren't available at the national level, or multi-state level, um, the 2019 results were compared to one care's performance on those measures for the 2018 program year, which was the case for two of those 10 payment measures. Um, beginning with the 2018 performance year as well and continuing into 2019, um, one care was also able to start earning bonus points for each measure um, that had available benchmarks or demonstrating statistically significant improvement over their prior year's performance. Um, I went through that really quickly, but I would like to now turn it over to my colleague, Pat Jones, who will talk more specifically to OneCare's actual 2019 quality performance. Great. Thank you, Amy, and good afternoon to everybody. Um, so I'm going to give a high-level summary of the ACO's performance in 2019, and then in our last slide, um, I'll really dig into detail on how they performed on each of the measures. So for 2019, the ACO's overall quality score was 95%. Um, for the 10 payment measures. And that compares to a score of 85% in, in 2018. As Amy mentioned, there are eight measures for which we had national benchmarks. And for three of those measures, one care's performance exceeded the national 90th percentile. And we tend to think of 90th percentile as um, the highest achievable benchmark. I mean, that, that, that's a very high level of performance. So that was the case for three of the measures. There was one measure, and that's the developmental screening in the first three years of life measure, where there is no 90th um, national percentile. Tile. Um, the measure comes out of Oregon. Um, it's used widely by CMS and by uh, many states. 
Um, but the highest published benchmark we have for that is the 75th percentile. And in the case of that measure, one care's performance exceeded that national 75th percentile. <clears throat> for another measure, um, one care's performance was between the national 75th and 90th percentile. For two measures, their performance was between the national 50th and 75th percentile. And then for one measure, it was between the national 25th and 50th percentile. And I'll get into detail on which measures fell into which category. As Amy mentioned, national benchmarks were not available for the remaining two payment measures. Um, so in lieu of, of that, OneCare's 2019 performance was compared to their 2018 performance. And for both of those measures, performance improved in 2019. For five measures um, in this set, there was statistically significant improvement from 2018 to 2019. And that includes one of the measures, one of the two measures for which there was not a national benchmark. So Michelle, if you could advance. Great, thank you. So I want to start with the key um, because this describes how points are assigned for performance for each of the measures. So for measures where performance is equal to or below the 25th percentile, no points would be awarded. For measures between the 25th and 50th percentile, half a point would be awarded. Above the 50th percentile, one point. Above the 75th percentile, one and a half points with one exception, which is that measure, the developmental screening measure, where there is no 90th percentile. In that case, um, they were awarded two points for performance above the 75th percentile. And then above the 90th percentile, also two points. We don't, um, we don't, put our measures into domains the way that Medicare does. But I do want to note that the measures uh, broadly follow some of the areas, the high level goals in the all payer model. So we have um, mental health measures. We have two of those in, out of the 10 measures. We have three measures that speak to treatment for substance use disorder. We have three measures that speak to um, treatment or really in the case of these measures, it's um, heading into the territory of outcome measures for chronic conditions. And then we have um, a couple of more preventive care type measures as well. So if you look at the, um, at the table, um, what we've shown is a, a brief description of the measure the numerator and denominator. We show the 2019 rate, and that's where the key comes into play. That's where we show, um, you know, the the scoring. The 2018 rate is provided for reference. When we have national benchmarks, we provide those at the 25th, 50th, 75th, and 90th percentile. We then show the points that are awarded for performance and then bonus points awarded if there is statistically significant improvement. So the first measure is 30-day follow-up after discharge from the emergency department for alcohol and other drug abuse or dependence. For that measure, um, the ACO was in fact above the 90th percentile benchmark. It was an improvement over the 2018 rate. And in fact, it was a statistically significant improvement. So that um, resulted in one bonus point. A companion measure to that is the 30-day follow-up after discharge from the ED for mental health. And again, in this case, the ACO performed in excess of the 90th percentile. 
it was an improvement over 2018, but it was not a statistically significant improvement. And so there were no bonus points for that measure. The third measure is adolescent well care visits. Um, this is our measure with the largest denominator um, by far. Um, in this case, the ACO's performance was between the 50th and 75th percentile, and so they were awarded one point for that performance. It was a slight increase over 2018, but not enough um, to achieve statistically significant improvement. The fourth measure, all cause unplanned admissions for patients with multiple chronic conditions. There are nine uh, chronic conditions outlined in this measure. So people with two or more of those chronic conditions are considered as eligible. And um, it's a risk adjusted measure that looks at, um, at whether there are unplanned admissions. This is a measure where a lower rate is better and, and so in this case, um, the ACO did um, see improvement. The rate went down from 2018 to 2019. This is also a measure where we have no national benchmarks. And so in this case, even though the ACO improved, um, it was not a statistically significant improvement. And so they were awarded one point instead of two points for their performance on this measure. The next measure I've already talked about, um, this is a developmental screening in the first three years of life. This is a measure that does not have the 90th percentile benchmark. The ACO's performance is um, you know, quite a bit above the 75th percentile. It also uh, represents a statistically significant improvement from 18 to 19. So they um, attain the two points for performance and the additional bonus point. Diabetes, hemoglobin A1C, poor control. This is one of our chronic illness measures. Um, it is considered um, an outcome type measure. This is a measure where also um, lower is better. A lower number is better on this measure. And so once again, the ACO improved from 2018 to 2019, the rate was better than the 90th percentile, and the change was statistically significant. So in this case, again, two points for performance and the additional bonus point. Hypertension, another chronic illness measure, controlling high blood pressure. This measure, the ACO performed between the 50th and 75th percentile. This is a measure where there was a slight decline in performance from 2018 to 2019, not statistically significant. So they did not lose um, points for this. Um, as, uh, as a result of their performance, they achieved one point. Initiation of alcohol and other drug abuse or dependence treatment. Um, this is a measure where the ACO performed between the 25th and 50th percentile. This is a measure that um, you know we've been working on intensely in Vermont. Um, it's a challenging one. Um, because of the ACO's performance on this measure, they received only a half a point. And the companion measure to that, Michelle mentioned this in her comments, but um, some payers look at this as a composite. In our case, we look at this as two separate measures. And it, it looks at um, after sort of the initiation visit, does the person receive at least two more visits in the next 34 days um, after a new diagnosis of substance use disorder? And so in this case, uh, the ACO's performance improved from 18 to 19, and it was a statistically significant improvement. So they got the bonus point. Um, their performance was uh, between the 75th and 90th percentile, and so they got one and a half points for this. And then screening for clinical depression and follow-up plan, 
Um, this is a measure uh, where, again, the ACO improved um, from 18 to 19. It's also a measure where we don't have um, the national benchmark, so we looked at uh, change in performance over time. This was a statistically significant improvement, and so they um, received two points. So the, um, the total points with the uh, performance points and then the statistically significant improvement resulted in 19 points out of uh, 20 potential points. So that was, again, an overall performance of 95%. I just want to say, you know, from our perspective, um, this is strong and very encouraging performance to have um, this many measures um, above the 90th percentile, above the 75th percentile, seeing this level of um, improvement um, from year to year. Um, these are really encouraging results and I think reflective of the um, really hard work and good work that providers in Vermont are doing on behalf of Medicaid beneficiaries. So um, that, that does it for our presentation and thank you um, very much for your time and interest. So with that, Andrew, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Michelle. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Okay. My uh, screen is not synced up with my audio here, but I think it's working all right. So, hi, everybody. I'm Andrew Garland. I'm the Vice President of Client Relations and External Affairs for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. I have to admit, I'm somewhat pinch-hitting today. Uh, this isn't my area of expertise. Uh, but um, the person who would normally give this presentation is unavailable today. Joining me is uh, Micah Demers, one of my colleagues. He's in our quality improvement area. Uh, he's really an expert in these measures, and uh, Micah agreed to join today in case you have a uh, detailed question. So I'll take us through the high level, and then uh, we'll see where your questions go. So with that, Michelle, I think you can just turn us to the next slide. Uh, and I'll start just by saying um, that this is really important to us, and I, I'm thankful to the Green Mountain Care Board and to Medicare and Medicaid and all of the folks on the line today for the, for the dialogue. Um, the all-payer model and the work that the ACO is doing is directly aligned uh, with our mission and our vision uh, for a healthier Vermont and a healthier healthcare system for Vermont. Mm -hmm. So thanks, everybody, for this dialogue. I'm, I'm excited to be talking with you today. So I thought as a next step uh, on the next slide, Michelle, we can talk a little bit about what our program looked like in 2019. Uh, these are just some of the high levels and I'll slow down on the quality uh, aspects of the program. So this is a qualified health plan program in 2019. You, you probably know we had a, a pretty dramatic expansion in 2020, bringing a number of large clients into the program. But uh, this analysis of course predates that. Uh, the basic financial arrangement in 2020 was shared savings. Uh, as Michelle showed in her great slide, our, our metrics are a subset of the larger set, and we selected metrics that really resonate for a commercial population. Uh, as, uh, as others have noted, that you know the needs and challenges of our population are a little bit different than those uh, that Medicare or uh, and Medicare are facing. Medicare and Medicaid are facing. Um, our program works in a slightly different way. Uh, we, we ask One Care Vermont to set aside every year uh, dollars that equate to about one half percent of the total cost of care. And then they either distribute those dollars out to the providers in their network, or they retain the dollars um, to reinvest in quality programs depending on uh, their achievement on the scorecard each year. So for points they achieve, um, that, that frees up dollars to, um, to distribute out to the network. And for points that are missed, uh, those, that share of the dollars or the, the dollars that correspond to those points uh, stay with one care uh, to be reinvested in next year's quality program. And so the idea is uh, whether we're hitting the measures or missing them or you know, not hitting them as, as, as hard as we want, um, either way, we're reinvesting in uh, the network's ability to deliver quality improvement to our members. 
Um, we do have in our contract some collaboration requirements. So um, and we really try to stay close to One Care as they're doing this work. We recognize that Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont is a very important supporter. Uh, so we, we pay close attention to what's going on and, and uh, we ask at every step, what can we do to help? And then I'll just note that there was a pilot uh, program going on in 2019, actually continues to this day, uh, with the University of Vermont Medical Center uh, as a, our first ASO client to be participating in the all pair model with a relationship with One Care Vermont. I won't be reporting on those results today. Um, that's a very, very small pool. And I, I don't think we would want to equate their results with the QHP and reporting on them independently, I think is not going to tell us much just because the number of members is, is so small. Okay. And then on the next slide, um, this, you know, before we dive into the details, I thought it was just worth reflecting a little bit as Kelly did when she made uh, this update last year on what some of the bright spots and, and challenges are that we face. Um, when we look back at the 2019 uh, arrangement with One Care, and some uh, going forward, you'll see I, I snuck a 2020 on there at the end of the challenges because I had the white space to do so. Um, maybe most important on this slide are those first two bullets under bright spots. Uh, and really taken together, to me, they, they say that the Blue Cross team and the One Care team have a great collaborative approach to doing this work. Um, you know, if I if I look back at this arrangement, and I've been working on payment reform in Vermont since I started on on uh, payer related work or uh, provider related work back in the mid 2000s. Um, you know, I would say that up up until two or three years ago, most of our work in this space could still be characterized by the word negotiation. Uh, you know, when we worked with the ACO or other provider organizations before this. The tone of the conversations in, in both directions was really was really uh, dictated from a, contra a contracting point of view, always negotiating uh, on behalf of our organizations. But I feel like in the last year or two with, with One Care, we have really moved past that dynamic and um, fostered a new dynamic that, that would be better uh, characterized by the word collaboration. And as we've encountered a number of challenges sort of external to the program, but the challenges that nonetheless have impacted the program, the most obvious that, you know, being the, the pandemic, uh, we've been able to respond together quickly and, and in virtual lockstep in a way that I, I just think we wouldn't have been able to do four or five years ago. Uh, so that's really remarkable. It's an extremely strong base to build from. Um, another uh, really great uh, accomplishment for us in 2019, though it didn't technically go live until, until April of 2020, uh, was the work we did together to build uh, the first commercial prospective payment system. Sorry about that typo. Prospective payment system, and uh, one of the first that we know of um, of its kind in the nation. Uh, and that was a really, a really challenging undertaking, particularly on the technology side. Uh, and we're really thrilled with what we accomplished together. Uh, on the challenges side, uh, again, I would take those those two bullets, the first two bullets together. I think they're they're largely saying something very similar, um, which is it, it's still difficult for us to look at all the data that we have on our members and clearly distinguish the line between those that are in um, the one care model and those that are not. So, you know, one of the challenges of using this, this type of quality uh, scorecard program is that it is, it's not as directly tied to the work that the providers and the folks at One Care are doing every day as we would like. And these are pretty bottom line measures. And um, there's an awful lot of things that can affect them between the work that the providers are doing and the time that we actually getting a, get around to measure this. So you'll see I, I snuck a bright point in there under that first challenge. Uh, we've already worked with One Care to come up with a new approach uh, to our scorecard program for 2020 so that we're not relying so heavily on uh, measures which are so far downstream, but we'll have more built into the program that really allow us to see uh, One Care's work plan and um, you know look more closely at the results that are coming directly out of their actions. So that's pretty exciting stuff. And then a final point, um, you know, I, I heard the folks 
or uh, Michelle makes this point when she was talking about the Medicare program, uh, COVID-19, a major disruptor, both on our ability to measure quality results, but of course, as we move through 2020 and into 2021, uh, a major disruptor to providers and their, their ability to engage with us on any new quality improvement initiatives, uh, whether they're through the all-payer model or things that Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont would be working directly on. So I think we'll obviously have a very different discussion when we're together next year to look at the results of 2020. Okay, so let's, uh, oh, right. Uh, a few other things I wanted to point out. Um, there were some really exciting uh, collaborative uh, initiatives that we worked on together uh, in 2019 and some more that we have underway in 2020. Um, I mean, the, the two most uh, exciting for 2019 here on this page, um, one was us really working differently with One Care to try to provide to them uh, actionable practice level data. There's a, rather than relying only on high level data extracts, our, our quality team um, packaged some information to make it easier for them to serve out uh, things that they could be given directly to the provider population to help move the needle, both on the mental health substance use disorder side, and then also, um, as you'll see, and data related to some, some of the quality metrics on the scorecard. And then we also started working with them in 2019 on a, on a really exciting program that's a little bit aside from the quality uh, scorecard or, or much higher up uh, to get more folks into primary care. Uh, one of the things that our, our quality team and our nurses work on all the time are interventions designed to, to find those members uh, on our books who are not accessing their their primary care physician services regularly, trying to make contact with them and encourage them to go in and use um, those preventive benefits that are available to them. Uh, so in this initiative, um, we've worked, worked with OneCare to try to move some of that communication and encouragement uh, from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont directly to the primary care physician's office with the idea that people are more likely to pay attention or respond if they're getting that encouragement directly from their physician. Um, so that's pretty exciting work. And then on the next slide, I just listed out some other chronic condition, um, some other chronic condition management initiatives that we had conceived and begun talking to OneCare about even before the pandemic. And you'll, you'll see that um, they all involve uh, some, some form of telemedicine or telemonitoring. So, um, you know, we, we're encouraged that these are initiatives that we'll be able to continue to pursue through 2020 and 2021, even in the face of this very different uh, pattern of utilization that we're seeing across, you know, across Vermont, um, because these still involve our, the telemedicine or telemonitoring. So they're things that can go on even in the absence of the, the same kind of in-person care that, that we are used to seeing before the pandemic. So I've deferred the big finish here, a lot of suspense to the actual scorecard. Uh, so our, our scorecard has uh, just nine measures on it that are considered for payment. So these are the nine measures that affect that half a percent that one cares uh, sets apart. As Michelle indicated at the beginning of, uh, of the presentation, we also look at a number of other measures, CAPS measures primarily. Uh, those are reporting only measures. Uh, you can see here that uh, where we've indicated a check mark, one care uh, achieved full quality measures on, on, on a particular measure. And they did that by um, exceeding that national 90th percentile mm -hmm. that Pat um, mentioned. Mm -hmm. And we did make a change to our program in 2019, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, so that in order to achieve full points on a measure, even if it's a measure that's as tough as, say, uh, that uh, initiation engagement of alcohol and other drug dependence treatment, where our starting point is way down in, you know, uh, below the 25th percentile or around the 25th percentile, um, in order to achieve full points, they have to get to the national 90th. So, uh, and One Care was, was uh, willing to take on that challenge, really to recognize that we, we shouldn't be satisfied and say that we've fully accomplished um, what we needed to accomplish on any particular measure until we're the best in the nation. Uh, 
Uh, our program also allows them to earn some bonus points for having statistically significant improvement in at least two measures, uh, or in any particular measure, and they did that on two measures last year. So I didn't indicate this on the slide. I'm not sure why. I apologize. Um, they earned 14 and a half points out of a potential 18 um, because of those bonus points, which I I think equates to about 81% of potential points. And you can see, you know, measures like that um, initiation engagement of alcohol and other drug dependence treatment, um, you know, it's a, it's a long haul for us to get that up to the national 90th. Um, so we would we would not have expected them to get to 100%. That's a, that's a really, really high bar to accomplish. Um, but still, the way we've structured the program, the, the dollars that don't flow back to the provider network, again, remain with one care to reinvest in work on those measures that, that aren't at the national 90th um, this year. Another thing you probably notice on this slide is going to jump out, um, there's, you know, the ups and downs. It, I think it's important to keep in mind that even though this is a fairly large pool, um, it's still a fairly small pool. So. Uh, the denominators on some of these measures are are relatively small and I think are going to be significantly smaller than what we would see either in the Medicare pool or the Medicaid pool. So we would we would expect some more ups and downs. And then I did take a, a few minutes and look back at the uh, I looked back at the 2018 scorecard just to remind myself, and though the point system is a little bit different, um, the, the overall accomplishment is pretty significant. We had three measures in 2018 that were at the national 90th, um, statistically significant improvement in a couple of measures, and then a couple that, that swung in a different direction. So, um, you know, consistently good work here. And we're, we're really optimistic about House uh, Government Operations you know, Committee. Uh, we this, this are gathering here this morning and, to and, um, uh, beyond as we we move into this new approach that takes more of a, a work to continue plan our work on S124 and, and the scorecard is de-emphasized a little bit. We'll we'll still of course measure all of this stuff. Um, we know that's extremely important, but um, moving the payment uh, the payment part of the program to, to be more directly tied to the transformative work. Um, will be a really interesting experiment, and we're, we're thrilled that OneCare was willing to go there. That's all I had. I'm not, unlike Pat, I can't take you through these measures one at a time, but I think she covered all of them in, uh, in her slides, so thank you. Thank you, Andrew. So with that, uh, we'll turn it over for, to board questions. And you've got the full panel here, including Tyler from OneCare, uh, to jump in uh, and answer any questions that you might have for, uh, for them as well, or any questions that us payers can't, uh, can't answer. So I'll, I'll start off. Um, Pat, as really the... Um, the mother of the quality measures in the state of Vermont. Is there anything that jumps out at you that um, is alarming you? No, I don't think so. Um, I do think that, you know, you're seeing where some of the challenges are. Um, you know, initiating um, in particular and even engaging people in substance use disorder treatment is a real challenge. Um, and I'm sure there are multi um, faceted reasons for that that have everything to do with, um, you know, capacity, geography. Um, but, you know, those are even the engagement measure where we tend to do well. Um, if you look at the absolute rates, um, both for Vermont and nationally, they're very low. And so just continuing um, to work in those areas where we, um, you know, where we know that treatment helps and just, and we've done a lot in this state in terms of access to treatment and types of treatment, but you know, that continues to be a concern. Um, you know, on the plus side, seeing some of the improvements and, you know, 
some of the outcome measures like the diabetes um, for control measure, um, and just seeing the, the across the board um, improvement and the rather high level of improvement. Anything above 75th percentile um, is strong performance. And so it's really, again, I just want to say it's a reflection, you know, certainly of the work that people have done together, um, the ACO payers, um, you know, aligning measures, but also the providers really um, doing the hard work of, of quality improvement. Um, that to me is very encouraging. So I saw much more to be encouraged about than to be alarmed about. Any questions for board members? Um, I had one question for Pat as well. When you look at the the quality measures where we were saying, you know, the achievement was I think 19 out of 20, but um, I, when I look at it, I'm looking at it, it was like 15 out of 20, and then there were four bonus points. So how do we how do we um, look at that? Because wouldn't that really be there were 24 possible points? You know, or there's more than that, but they achieved some bonus points. So it's, you know, they there was 15 out of 20, and then they got four of the bonus points. So even if I said it was, you know, 15 out of 24, I just want to make sure we're reflecting you know, the right percentage of how we're doing. And, and obviously we're making improvements in a lot of places, but um, just wanted your reaction to that. Right, um, you know, in keeping, you know, the idea of the bonus point was to allow them to earn more. We did not change the denominator. So if you look strictly at performance, um, it, it was 15 points for performance. I will note that um, that if they had statistically significantly declined, um, they could have lost um, some of those bonus points as well. But there's no question that it was an opportunity to um, for them to increase the score. I, um, you know, I was. I, I think we were um, pleased and um, surprised at the level to which those improvements were statistically significant because that's a you know reasonably high bar. Okay. But, um, yeah, I'm not trying to penalize. I'm just trying to look at it. Yeah. You know, from from different way of, of the math. So thank you. Yeah. Other so, questions? <clears throat> Go ahead. So. Um, so I'm just kind of looking in uh, slide 14. You don't have to go there, um, uh, but it's uh, the verbiage was that of the 16 measures carried into 2019, improvement improvement was noted in 13 measures. Um, and I'm just wondering what what does improvement mean? Because when we get down into Medicaid, and I have a question there, but in Medicaid they're talking about statistical significant differences. Um, and in Medicare, its improvement was noted. And so I assume that's on that uh, 90, uh, you know, percent on that percentile. And was there a spread that was um, assumed that if, it, if, 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 if the uh, measure inc increased by a certain number in the spread, um, it, would, it would be considered an improvement? Yeah, so for Medicare, for Medicare, um, we do not yet have the statistically significant analysis done uh, from our federal partners. And so that's something I'm waiting on. So like I said, in those measures where we did not see an improvement and we saw a decline in the score, um, it's so minimal in so many cases that we're I'm not sure if it's statistically significant or not. Um, and the same goes for the, the noted improvements. There are some where I could make an educated guess and say that I think that they would have statistically significantly improved just based on that sort of gap. Um, but without that analysis, I'm, I'm not comfortable in answering that on their behalf. Um, once we do have that analysis, I'll be sure to pass it along to the board and we can certainly do an update to this presentation um, unless one care happens to have that and I do not. Um, but I, I do think, you know, if you just compare the two um, and see sort of that prior year performance rate and then against the 2019 performance rate 
but again, trying to keep uh, keep in mind that something that we're working through is taking into consideration those change, those massive changes in the scale population and changes in the denominator overall, um, and sort of what impact that has on performance. <clears throat> okay, um, and then so looking then at Medicaid um, and. It said, you know, five measures. There was statistically significant improvement, and there was the bonus point um, approach. But what can you talk a little bit more about what um, statistically significant means in that context? I mean, what is the hypothesis that X caused Y, and and so there is a, a spread in the numbers? But is it just the fact that it's associated with the ACO or my phone's ringing in the back. I'm sorry. I, I, I don't know if you can hear it, but um, so I just, if you could have a few more sentences about, I mean, you know, how, how can we be assured that the statistically significance is aligned with these measures in the ACO program? Yeah, thank you, Tom. I, you know, I think all we can say when you're looking at statistically significant improvement is all you can say is, um, you know, the measure improved and probably at a level that was not due to chance. Um, right. You know, what the factors were in that improvement, um, whether we're reaching a um, level of alignment of measures and a critical mass of um, attributed uh, folks that it, you know that that provider that allows providers to really focus on this. I don't know that we can say that, um, but you know to have um, year over year improvement um, that is statistically significant it seems like we're really going in the good direction. I mean, most of our measures um, improved. We saw improvement, um, but half of those payment measures saw um, improvement at a statistically significant level. Um, you know, I think as Michelle said, there's a lot of digging into as to the why and how best to capture this, but um, directionally things look, um, look good at this point. Yeah, I, mean, I, I would agree that, I mean, the, the flow is in the right direction, um, and we have two or three more years, uh, at least within the all-payer model, to kind of continue to, to track this and learn more and, and have more data. I just, I just, you know, because of some of the controversy around the ACO, um, aligning and linking these quality improvements and, and this positive flow to the ACO, I think is an important um, uh, uh, consideration as opposed to saying some of the Medicaid numbers are better because over in the education department, you know, for kids on Medicaid, they improve nutrition, you know, and it's kind of like, you know, in a different arena. So, um, uh, you know, it's it's the, obviously the directions um, 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 in, in, you know, in, in a positive way, and that's a good that's thing. A good the um, final, my, my final thing is uh, for Blue Cross Blue Shield, now that Blue Cross Blue Shield is um, engaging with the ACO, I, I wonder if, um, um, and I could be totally off base on this, but, but to me, the benchmark plan for the QHP population hasn't been kind of reconsidered since its inception, which I think is in like 2012 or 2013 was the basis for that plan. And, and uh, one of the areas, for example, that we see here is diabetes. And one of the areas, you know, in the um, benchmark plan is diabetes. But there's no organized program in the benchmark plan uh, to uh, avoid the diabetes. There's no organized pre-diabetic program. And I'm just wondering if Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, might uh, kind of uh, uh, urge the ACO and other um, partners and participants to revisit that benchmark plan in order to make sure it's as aligned as possible with the goals of of the quality goals that we're talking about here. Um, I you know I do understand that some who were there when the benchmark plan was first crafted that it was kind of a food fight with everybody trying to get their you know their their um, uh, service 
uh, in, in, in engaged. But you know, I, I think you know folks can say there's a limit here. We're just looking at prevention now in terms of the restructuring of this benchmark plan and uh, move forward in that regard. Yeah, thanks. We we have introduced some optional plans that are really focused on some of the issues that you um, that you described, Tom. But I I'm sure the folks on on our team who are working every day to to um, design benefits would would be thrilled to sit down, you know, with other stakeholders and look again at the benchmark designs and ask, you know, not, you know, now that we know what we know, um, where the network is able to engage, how can we do this? How can we do this better or differently? Um, to make it easier for members to make those connections. And that, that's a the question that's on our minds all the time. In fact, I have a task force working on this this question of why 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 are people not taking advantage of zero cost share services, uh, which we know they need and and we tell them they need and they acknowledge and still say, well, we're not going to go because we're worried about cost. So I, I think those are really important issues and and um, I will absolutely pass that encouragement along. Thank you. Other questions from the board? Hi, this is Robin. Um, I had a follow-up question for Andrew related to the work plan approach. I was interested in hearing a little bit more granularity about how you're thinking of approaching that and um, uh, just maybe giving a couple of examples about how you would use that for the quality measurement. Yeah, well, I will admit that we are still working on the specific. So if I don't offer them, it's not that I'm being evasive. But the, the idea is that instead of saying, you know, let's, let's move the money around based on the results for adolescent well care visits, we want to move that question upstream a little bit or downstream, I guess, depending on your perspective. And we start by asking the ACO, okay, well, what are the plans for 2020 or 2021 to move the needle on adolescent well care visits? Let's show us that work plan and let us, um, let us sit down together and agree on a point structure that is tied to some of those activities that you specifically hope to, to put in place and let's find some measurables between the work and the very, very sort of downstream quality measure um, to see if we can get a better sense of how the action is, is turning into results. Because to Tom's really good question and Pat's great answer, it's hard to tell. I mean, this, as, as everybody knows, there are so many dynamics at play in this healthcare system. And, you know, when you push on something, whether or not the thing that's, you know, 15 dominoes down the, down the line actually falls can be really hard to know, you know, did it fall because of that push or did something else come in and, and uh, influence it? So, so that's the change we're trying to affect there. I think we'll have a better sense. Uh, over the next couple of months, what that's going to look like specifically, but we were we were really thrilled that the, the ACO was open to making that kind of change. Yeah, it sounds like an interesting approach because I I do think one of the challenges, as we've talked about, is uh, and as Pat alluded to when referencing scale, is that the quality measurement results care at the individual provider level, and so. There could be a lot of different things going on in an individual provider's office that may uh, affect those. Um, so that's interesting. Um, I guess the other question that I had that I just wanted to ask um, uh, the Diva team and the Blue Cross team is, uh, if uh, based on the quality measurement in, in 2019, where are the areas that you think uh, it's most fruitful to focus on moving forward in the quality arena, given all the dynamics around uh, the different areas. I'm just curious of, of, in your opinion on that. Uh, I'll start with that. This is Pat. Um, I, you know, I think I alluded to it earlier, but I think continued work um, in the substance use disorder treatment arena um, is is going to be really important, um, you know, and and partly because it 
um, it, it rolls up into um, the tragedy of um, deaths from drug overdose um, and other um, morbidities from substance use disorder. So, um, you know, given, and it's a challenge, it's an all hands on deck um, approach. It's not that we can expect the providers to do this alone. It's not that we um, can expect the state to do it alone, the payers to do it alone. Um, this is a multi-year, all hands on deck effort. Um, and it's one of the really unique elements of our approach to quality, which is that, you know, we're looking at, um, at areas that are, um, you know, it's hard to, to improve in silos. Um, they involve public health efforts as well as uh, clinical interventions and having capacity for treatment and um, giving people the support they need to get treatment. But um, to me, again, when I um, okay. look at the, at the results.